Okay, this is uh, class 10 of the Golden Doves. We're still in the introduction, Roman numeral 15, and the paragraph that starts rabbinic authority. Okay, so this is the introduction. Everything we've done now has just been introductory in the sense that we've really just touched upon and skirted different subjects. We didn't go into any subject bill. Yun, you know, so each one of these subjects will be dealt with um, in due course. So let's continue now with another. This is subject. after we... I would say this is after we spoke about the diachronic and synchronic axis of the Torah. That's the, I mean, we don't have to say it here again because it's a bit previous video, but that's like the, this is the continuation of that idea and yeah. showing the connection of that to rabbinic thinking. Right. Okay, so let's start now. Rabbinic authority. Chavod. Rabbinic authority comprises three fundamental institutions. One, okay, transmission of... You know, why, why do I have to listen to the hachamim? Why do I have to listen to the rabbis? So the standard answer is because they're doim, they're doim, they're great, they're doim. You have to listen to them. But why? Because you have to listen to them. It's the rabbi. You must listen to the, to the, to the, to the gadol. And what's good about this book is that it phrases rabbinic authority. Why do I have to, what is their authority in terms of political legal institutions because every nation has institutions and these institutions have authority right so if you can't answer this question what are the what is the basis of rabbinic authority then you know then then religion becomes a free-for-all you listen to that rabbi you listen to that rebbe i listen to that rebbe and you know everybody has their own uh, you know uh way to go so no they are institutions and these are the three fundamental institutions that rabbinic authority is based upon. Bechavod. One, transmission of the Torah. Two, derasha, interpretation of the scripture. And three, Torah, judicial application of the Torah and the promulgation of new legislation. Okay, number one. Second, I'm just looking at the end. No. Go ahead. Yeah, shall I? Shall I may, may I? Um, so number one. Um, the hachamim have the authority, and as a matter of um, uh, a national institution, the nas national institution that receives the Torah generation after generation after generation is the Bet Din of the Jewish people. The hachamim of the Jewish people are the ones that receive the Torah, and because they receive the Torah, they transmit the Torah. That's the first thing. So that's authority. Now you can understand that in terms of authority, right? We, we, we entered into a covenant in Har Sinai with Hashem. We bound ourselves to the laws of the Torah. And what is the Torah? The Torah was masur to the, to the betin of the Jewish people and to the next betin and to the next betin. That's the first basis of authority. They're the ones who have the Torah. Number two. They also have the authority to make derasha on the Torah. And we're going to see there's a relationship between these two things. That's in chapter four of the Golden Doves. Because they are the ones who receive the transmission of the Torah, they also have the right to make derashot on the Torah. And by derashot on the Torah, we don't mean, you know, what color was the ketonot pasim of Yosef? What was the real color? We're not talking about those types of derashot. Or, you know, what fruit did Adam Arishon eat? Was it wheat or was it grape? That's not my dad. What are the laws of the Torah? Those derashot, okay? Derashot that have to do with halacha. And that's related to the third thing, hora'a, judicial application of the Torah. Since you can be doresh the Torah and say that a particular word means this, you can also give instruction on how to fulfill the Torah. So you see how these three things, one leads to the other. Number one, they receive the Torah and they can transmit the Torah. Because they receive the Torah, they have the right to make the lashot in the Torah and to interpret the text of the Torah from the perspective of Allah. Because they have that right, they can tell us, this is what you are obligated to do. It's all based upon political institutions of the Jewish people, and it makes perfect sense to any thinking person. The idea of, of G'dayli makes sense to some people. It doesn't make sense to everybody. Right, that, and that's an important point. Read. Um, do you mind if we open the text in Mishneh Torah, which he brings in the footnote? 
Of course not. One which, second. Which chapter is it? I'll open it now. Chod Mamrim. Yeah. Chapter one, Halachot Aleph and Bet. The first Halachot, actually. One second. I can share it on the screen if you want me to. If that makes. I have it. No, I have it. You I mean you could share it for the sake of the class, but I have it. Okay, so give me a moment. Here we go. Perek Aleph. I'm going to do a screen share now. Uh, okay, share screen. Okay, go ahead, read. So you notice... So they are Torah yeah. Shabbat meaning they they the Torah Shabbat is within the sole jurisdiction of the Betin Gadol Shebirushalayim, right? And they have the right to make Horaot, and they have the right to issue these Horaot to all the Jewish people, unlike a local Betin, which can only give instructions to the local community. One second, one moment. Yes, I do. You heard me before? No, nope, I did not. Okay, so I'll continue. I, I specifically paused the video, understanding the sensitivity of any information that may be exchanged. So everything was not, in other words, I paused the recording, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> That's so right. Here you see explicitly the Torah Shebikhtav explicitly says Ta'ase, you must do this, meaning you must follow the rules and instructions given to you by the Bittina Gadol. It's explicit, black on white. Mm-hmm. Right. And, it, and look at what it says. If you are bound by the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, as any Jew who is part of the covenant is bound by the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, you are obligated to rely on them for ma'aseh haddat. That's so important. Ma'aseh haddat is how do I perform the laws of the Torah, right? What are te- tefillin? What is arva'am minim? Right? When do I count the Omer? How do I count the Omer? All those things, is, it is within the soul, an exclusive jurisdiction of the Betina Gadol Shibirushalayim, as the Torah explicitly says, Ta'aseh. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Uh, by the way, the Nusach may be different here between what I'm reading and what's here because I'm using the Yohanna Pili edition. Right. And it's not in the Pasuk, it says actually, Thank you, that's a good point. And this is, um, and, that's, and, and that's important. So here we see that there is an absolute obligation, and you don't have an option if you won't listen to what they tell you. In terms of how to perform the misfot in the Torah, you are violating a lot ta'aseh. And this is one of Shedah's famous uh, points. Every misfot de Rabbanan, anytime you violate a misfot de Rabbanan, you're also violating a misfot de Oraita, because it's lot asul min ad ashi la gidu lecha. Right, I actually remember as a child, when I was a child, I, I, told, I remember where, like, you know, it was in an old house in Greenberg. Yes. Talking a little bit about the halachot, whatever. And I was saying that. I remember asking Daddy, like, if it says in the Torah, "Lotus Minat Davar," then I guess it means that the, that if anybody who doesn't do something that Rabbanan is actually not doing something to Oraita. And you huh. tell me, as Zeda said that. Remember the. That's very nice. That's very very nice, right? So here I'm looking at the pasuk in the Torah as I'm just putting it on the screen. Al pi Torah asher yorucha ve'al hamishpat asher yomeru lecha ta'ase. You must do as they tell you. 
to do. And then it says, And you may not deviate from what they tell you. So this is the point of Harambam. There's a misvat ase and a misvat lot ase. Right. Mm, I think okay. that's it. One second. No, then there's had had the body to the middle of 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 uh-huh. Then the last one, we had the which is Quran, right? I think. Oh, hora'a, no, no. Hora'a includes anything. Hora'a includes anything. Let me explain. There's three different types of um, um, uh, 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 There's three types of situations where the betin will give you instructions. Num- number one, if it's mipia shemua. That is the instruction they received from Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu taught Yehoshua but you know, and they received the Masoret that this is what an etrog, Peri Aisadar is an etrog. That's the Varim Shalamdu as in Piyashemua. They didn't invent it, and it comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, that's one type of law. That's Rikav Torah Be'al Pe. That's Midavre Sofri. Okay. Number two. So you must listen to them. You can't, for example, decide to choose a cucumber for a lulav just because you find a cucumber to be more convenient. Okay. Number two, um, uh, there are laws which are called dinim muflaim. And in the case of dinim muflaim, they have the right to make derashot. And if they make a derashot and they say, this is the way that you do kiddush al hayayin, then you do kiddush al hayayin. And if you don't do kiddush al hayayin, you're ovel misfat aseh, ovel misfat aseh. And finally, number three, Three, if they make gezerot and tekanot, they're not torshim a pasuk. They, right. just, they didn't receive it from Moshe Rabbeinu. It's not in the Torah Shebikhtav. It's a pure derabanan law. They decide that asur likro leor haner sheme yateh. Pure derabanan law. In each one of these three, three cases, you are ovel al isur deoraita. Love and misvat aseh. And uh, uh, mm-hmm. the first institution involved the process of Abdallah Misira, recep- reception, surrendering, whereby one generation receives the legacy of the preceding generation and then passes it to the next. Here explain are. That. Wait, explain that. Okay. Okay. That's a diachronic access. That's a diachronic access, right? So there is Kabbalah, there's Le Kabbel, and Shjada has a whole chapter in the um, appendix to the uh, Horizontal Society about the Kiblem. Yes. And what does it mean, right? Le Kabbel, I'm sorry. And then there is Limsor, right? The two things. If you're Mekabel, then you could be Moser, right? That has to do with the diachronic axis. This is really fascinating. This is really what which what we're reading here is truly fascinating because he really he frames it so perfectly in terms of Ferdinand de Saussure's um uh, linguistics and the uh, diachronic and synchronic axis. It's absolutely fabulous. Right. Whereby one generation receives the legacy of the preceding generation and then passes it to the next. Here are the here are operated the two basic perspectives, the, di- the diachronic axis. The upward view towards the past and the downward view toward the future. Right. So when you are Mikabel, you're looking up towards the past. And when you're Moser, you're looking down towards the future. But the two things are two sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. The second institution concerns the synchronic study and application of the Torah. Beautiful. How do we today understand this pasuk or this word? Beautiful. The purpose of Dirashah is not to interpret scripture on the basis of objective 
verifiable data, but rather to generate meaning from the text of the scripture on the basis of the linguistic, cultural, and psychological factors binding the coexisting terms of Judaism. Right. That's so beautiful. So you have a pasuk in the Torah, Zachor et Yom Shabbat Lekadesho. It doesn't matter to me, and, and, and we don't have a perush mekubat for Moshe Rabbeinu, because if we had a perush mekubat for Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm not talking about that. If we have something with Piyah Shemuah, then it's with Piyah Shemuah. We don't go against what we receive from Piyah Shemuah. We're dealing with situations where we didn't receive from Moshe Rabbeinu. Right. How to perform a pasuk. So Zachor et Yom Shabbat Lekadesho, we didn't receive from Moshe Rabbeinu. The hachamim in their days, culturally speaking, if you wanted to commemorate a great event, you would do it over a cup of wine. That was the way it was done. Until today, people always bring out a cup of wine and make a toast. And so the hachamim instituted the Chorik Yom HaShavat Lekadesho on the synchronic axis, because that's the way people understand commemoration on a beautiful cup of good quality, expensive wine. That's Zuchrehu al Hayyain. So you see how the synchronic axis is completely different than the diachronic axis. In Mi Piyashemwa, Mashikibalnu, Anakhnu Nekayem. Kiyemu, the Kibelu. Here, no. Here it was left open. Moshe Labenu says, You figure out how to do this Masva at the synchronic axis. And that's why any Din Mufla can be abrogated by a future betin. Why can a future betin abrogate a, um, a, 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 a din mufla? Precisely because it's done on the synchronic axis. And it could be that there will come a generation, I don't know that this is the case. And I'm not saying that this will be the case. I love doing Kiddush Alayayin, don't get me wrong. But it could be that there will be a generation where instead of commemorating things on wine, People don't do that anymore, and maybe it becomes meaningless. And then the hachamim of that generation can abrogate the original misva of zuchreu al ayin and say, now we do it a different way. Now we do it differently. For the bedin, which is obviously the bedin musma. Of course. Only the bedin agadol. Untrained listeners would ask, what does it mean? Well, of course, only the bedin hagadol. Hayoshev birushalayim. Says explicitly, and what we just read, that the 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 derashot they make on the yad midot, a latter betin she gadol mimenu bechokma of minyan, meaning it has to be greater in quantity, greater in wisdom. That future betin may decide to abrogate the din mufla, the yad midot of the previous betin. Of course, there are certain conditions. It's not a free for all. Nothing is a free for all. But you see theoretically, how perfectly it fits with the concept of synchronic axis. That's beautiful. That, hmm. From the perspective of the axis, of, sorry, from the perspective of this axis, the Torah has a wholly valid existence apart from its specific history or diachronic axis. Right. That is what he says, by the way, about Abedina Gadol Shibit Shalayim, Synchronic axis. Today, there is a synchronic axis. Right, no, Mechila, I don't agree. I, uh, Mechila, I don't agree with that interpretation. It includes both. It includes all of the various forms, whether it's a diachronic axis, which is Mipia Shemua, whether it's a synchronic axis, which is Derashot and Yag Midot and Dinim Uflaim. It includes everything. When it says, Yes. Medina Gadol? Yes. Look at look. No, the diachronic axis is included in everything till that day. Medina Gadol Shi Birushalaim Hemi Kartola Shabe Al Peve Mamud Wara. And then he says, um, and then he says, Ehad Devarim Shalam Duo Tami Pishemua. That's one thing the Betina Gadol does. That's the diachronic axis. Okay. Right. Where they go back to Moshe Rabbein Uvehem Tora Shabe Al Pe. You see the same word, by the way, Tora Shabe Al Pe. So that's what the Torah Shabbat we receive from Moshe Rabbeinu. That Torah Shabbat is called Ikar Torah Shabbat because there's different types of Torah Shabbat There's Torah Shabbat we got from Moshe Rabbeinu. That's Ikar Torah Shabbat mm -hmm. That's immutable. That will never change. But then there's a Torah Shabbat where the Hachamim 
they make derashot and they add gezerot, they make tekanot. That's also Torah Shabbat Alpeh, but that's not Ikar Torah Shabbat Alpeh. Got it. Right. 100%. Hmm. Good point. I'm glad I wrote that up. I'm glad we yes. got yes. that back and forth. The rabbis saw themselves. Okay, from the perspective of this axis, the Torah. Okay, so the rabbis saw themselves and the Jewish people as the linguistic community who spoke and actually lived the Torah. Beautiful. That's so beautiful. So I give you an example. I can make a derasha. You know, I can make a derasha. This, by the way, also applies to derasha. Colloquial derashot. Why are you not listening to it? They always spoke the Torah. Anytime there was something, there would always be a pasuk. Now, when they use a pasuk against somebody, you know, lechel nemala asel, right? Or baslatam yimacham kare. When they use the pasuk, was that the original meaning? But they always use these pasukim because the Torah was living. That's at the synchronic axis, right? Of the beautiful derashah of Jedah. I love that derasha that uh, that uh, that they told me from Argentina that Yeshua Salim told me when he was in Asia Kila in Argentina that there was a guy uh -huh. uh, betting on the horses. He used to go Shabbat to do horse. Uh, they used to do uh, the, the, the the horse racing, you know, betting. Oh, not OTB. I don't know what they had in Argentina. <laughs> anyway, so Jeda got up in uh, in Knis and gave a famous famous derasha. Sheker Hasus Lichua. And the, and the whole family, they all made Teshuvah. They stopped going to the races. Today, the grandchildren of that guy, they're all black hats and yeshivot, studying Torah. So, Sheker Hasuz, Lichuah. That's a perfect example of a derasha. Is that the Peshat? Was, was David HaMelech thinking about horse racing when he said Sheker Hasuz, Lichuah? No, he was thinking about wars. He was thinking about wars, right? And Jedah used it synchronically. Like the Hachamim used to use Peshachim synchronically. That's a beauty of this synchronic that I saw. This perspective must exclude all diachronic notions. There is neither before nor after to the Torah. One second, maybe not. As a... Wow. And while you're looking for the source, so don't tell Jdeda, hey, Hacham, how can you say Kshekher Asus Lichua is referring to horse racing in the days of David HaMelech? They didn't have horse racing. Irrelevant. We're looking at the Torah synchronically. And, for and that's also, by the way, in the Talmud, many times, they mefarshim a certain pasuk in a way to explain a certain story. To yes. You know, um, al zene imar, like suddenly you have one of the stories of the Imoraim, and then they'll say, al zene imar, etc. They'll bring a pasuk and say, oh, the, so one person will say, you see, when the pasuk was written, it was in the ah, speaking about the story of this and that. That's one way to look at it. But the synchronic perspective is, no, the synchronic aspect of the pasuk, that pasuk was perfect for the situation. Exactly. But diachronically, that wasn't what the pasuk meant. Exactly. So there's a diachronic and there's synchronic. And at the synchronic level, because for us, the Torah was a living text. It wasn't the museum, something we put away in a closet. It was a living book. So many times we would use the Pesukim on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what we're By the way, Jdeda, I'm saying, and all of that older generation used to use Pesukim on a day-to-day -day basis. To talk to, when they were talking, there was no it was all Pesukim. You know, it was all Pesukim. Exactly. That's where they used to speak. Yes, yes, correct. Right. There is neither before nor after the Torah, declared the rabbis. Chronological considerations is that en muharum en mukdamu muhar b'torah? Yes, en muk en muk right en mukdamu muhar b'torah. So he interprets that when you're studying the Torah at the synchronic level, en mukdamu muhar, and you can be doresh the Torah this way, you can be doresh it that way, and don't tell me oh, but wait, but historically and chronologically, chronologically, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter because the two axes are mutually exclusive. You see, so again, you see here how many of the ideas that the general linguists and the structuralists took, they were ideas that were generation upon generation among the rabbinic thinkers, among the hachamim. Right? That's also something important. A lot of people, I mean, I've heard people say, oh, why does he need to speak about linguistics in the book? Why does he need to speak about linguistics? How does it help? Right. And, the, and the answer is, it's not that he used linguistics. Linguistics, and because he studied linguistics, now he's teaching the Torah based on his new understanding of linguistics. Yeah. Much like the Wiesenschaft Judentum, by the way. That's the way they do it, objective teaching of the Torah. No. 
Because linguistics had something which the Torah had beforehand, right. he was able to show the parallelism between the two fields of study and right. show the sharpness in Hachamim. Right, and, and not only that, I want to say something. Um, and this is important. Maybe we'll end here because I see it's we're already uh, coming to the uh, point where it's a good place to end. Um, um, we can continue till the next paragraph on the paragraph on the next page, I think. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something afterwards. I want to address your point, but let's finish this thing. Okay. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not, no, you know, let's do it. All right. So chronological considerations are not to be interpolated into the axis. Into this axis, namely the synchronic axis. Exactly. Likewise, concerning scriptural verses appearing in different places, the rabbis declared that they were uttered in a single statement. Um, and this is another important point. When we interpret the Torah at the derasha level, we assume there is no time. Time collapses. So the Torah is a separate semiological system where all the elements in the Torah coexist at the same moment and they're all there in front of me. And when I interpret any given element, I have to assume that the existence of all other elements are contemporaneous with the element that I'm interpreting. So at the structuralist, structuralist level, I'm always going to be interpreting words in the Torah relative to other words. And the Gemara does this all the time. They bring the Rashot from, from Yaakov and from Rahel and from Le'ad because they did this, Halakha is like this. But Efo, what, what are you talking about? That was before Matan Torah, that was... No, because that's the essence of looking at the Torah at the synchronic axis. That's exactly the point, right? I like it. Yeah, fascinating. How else can you understand the Gemara? How can you understand the derashot? If you don't understand this, it seems ludicrous. But and, that's important. Right. <laughs> Meaning that they should they must be explained synchronically, as if um, constituting a single conceptual unit. The whole Torah is one unit. And all the elements exist relative to every other element. So yes, you can make a derasha from Rachel and Le'ah to the laws of Ketuvah and Perashat Mishpatim. Right. Right. And that is in opposition what all the crazy say. Yeah, yeah, of course. Look, this was written in the time, that, you know, the Ugaritic, I don't know what. Yeah, right. But I will ask, I, I mean, one of the points of Abraham Shalom Yehuda, right. the book, The Accuracy of the Bible, the Father Christian shows the accuracy of the Bible against the biblical critics that were in his time right. to show that certain terminology used in books like Shemot with terminology used in ancient Egypt at the time would show the validity of the Torah. Right. Let me, let me explain. I think, oh, what? I'm sorry. I thought you, want, you want to answer that question? Go ahead. I'm, I'm going to tell you what I think and then you'll correct me. You'll give me what you think. I think it's okay to understand it that way, as long as you understand that it was all given in one block. It was written in one, one's writing by Moshe Ben with the end of the 40 years in the desert, synchronically speaking. But no problem. Synchronically speaking, Moshe Ben understood what Ben Israel understood ter terminology termin at a terminological level in Egypt. Let me, let, me, let me address the question really simply using Ferdinand de Saussure. We're not saying that the Torah doesn't have a diachronic axis. We never said that. The Torah has a diachronic axis. And what we are saying, and what Avraham Shalom Yehuda is saying, is that if you look at the particular usage of language in Perashat Mikes, that usage of language is evidence that it came from that historical period. So he's looking at the Torah diachronically, which is perfectly legitimate, and he's trying to examine in that point in history, what was the linguistic um, phraseology? 
what type of phrases did people use? What were the syntactical combinations that people had? And he shows that those very syntactical combinations from that time in Egypt are appearing, are, are, are used in Perashat Mikes. So he's using it just as evidence to show that indeed only a person in that period of time could have, um, could have spoken those words and could have spoken those words in that particular way. That's examining the Torah at the diachronic level, and there's nothing wrong with that. What's the difference between that and the biblical critics? Oh, um, from, from, okay. a, from, I'm saying from a methodological point of view. Because they also, they say, listen, look at the, if you look at this in this pasuk, it's parallel to the same name that was used in a different country to, to, for the same, for something else. Right, right. I mean, you know, first of all, the biblical critics, they don't treat the Torah as one text. They, they, they come with an a priori notion that the Torah was written by several people. And the reason they reach that, uh, that, that, that a priori notion is based upon their misreading of the text of the Torah. So they come with certain, you know, um, what they call scientific standards of, uh, of how to read a text. And they impose, and these are Western scientific standards, actually German scientific standards. And they impose that upon the Torah because the Torah doesn't match those German standards um, enunciated in the University of Berlin. And then they say, and therefore the Torah must have been written by several people. I mean, that's. So could it be, so could it be Daddy, that they were looking at the Torah exclusively at the diachronic axis? That a, were, you, you got looking at the Torah exclusively as a diachronic no. work. No. A, and B, right. interpreting it in their warped view right. of the diachrony of what the Torah is. No, no, I mean, they gave two no, things. There's nothing no. wrong with looking at the Torah at the diachronic level. It's perfectly legitimate. We do it all the time. Right, no, there's well, a legitimate way to do it. Right. But there's also an illegitimate way to do it, no, 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 the no. way they were doing it. The problem with the reason of the Sudentum, the problem with the uh, scientific study of Judaism and the biblical criticism, which comes after that, is that they take a Western compass and they impose it upon rabbinic thinking, upon Jewish texts. And because the Jewish texts, they don't fit perfectly within the square. It's actually shaped like a triangle. So they say, well, this triangle is really a square. It's just a misshapen square. And here's how the, the, the square, it's actually a triangle. Here's how this square, right? This is what happened to the square. This is why it's a bit misfigured. The rabbis were, were not so intelligent. They didn't really know how to draw the four sides properly, right? And then they give a whole derasha about how the triangle is a square, but it's just a really bad square. That's a biblical critics. And it's just, it's not even, not that it's not important, but for us, it's not important. If anybody finds biblical criticism attractive for some reason, you know, stay out of this class and go to those classes because <laughs> I have nothing more to say. I mean, if, you know, we, we read about the recent job, the Sudentum. We had a bunch of classes about that. So let's now focus on... Um, okay, we'll uh, actually see in the... We'll finish with an answer to that. Yes. As noted by the Ben Nisim Gaon, this serves as one of the foundations of rabbinic exegesis. Exegesis is derasha. Yes. Um, I remember when I first read the Golden Dove Review, I was like, what is that word? Right. Back in. Right, and the, and the basis of rabbinic exegesis is that the whole Torah is contemporaneous. And as I said, every word in the Torah is contemporaneous with every other word, and that we understand the words structurally, one in opposition mm -hmm. to the other. So ish, ish, each, right, ish, ish, ish means ish, the, and the second ish means isha. That can only work in a structuralist system, yeah. As in all value systems, one may not apply to one axis the values of another. Right. You only have the judge of your own generation, declared the rabbis, right? Right, so when, it, when, it, when, when the Dayanim want to apply one of the Dinim Muflaim, and they have the Agmidot, they would apply it according to their understanding and according to their standard. Yes, I think that's the Hebrew. Thus, oh, yeah. right, I think that's the trans, that's what he's referring to, Not I believe. Maybe, I'm not sure. Or in, um, okay, then I mean, fine. We'll take a look later. We, have to, we would have to open it, right. Thus, one may not refer to the earlier days, but rather must accept the contemporary authority. Okay, I'm, I, I, I wasn't with you, but I'm going to get back to it now. 
Um, thus, one may not refer to the earlier days, but rather must refer to the contemporary authorities. Right. So if you want to know what the Pesach Halacha is, you go to the Betin in your generation. You don't go to the Betin, what the Betin said in the previous generation, because that's not relevant anymore, right? So the Betin of your generation has the obligation to uh, be Morim, their generation, to give guidance to their generation, and you have the obligation to accept that guidance. You want me to see if I could pull up to Tosiftan Rosh Hashanah or this? So we'll do is we're going to go over this. I want to go over this um, next time, this last few sentences. So let's stop here. Um, okay. I just want to answer a point you made earlier. Yes. Um, this is an important point. Um, why is it appropriate to use linguistics of Ferdinand de Saussure, structuralist thinking, um, post-structuralist thinking in, in the way that we're doing it. Give me just one moment.